Hey church, this is Sean. Hope everybody's doing well. Just wanted to have something here for us for this Wednesday as we're counting down the days until we can meet in person again. And with that in mind, just a quick few things to cover. We are still planning for a May 24th as our first Sunday back together in person. But as we get closer to that date, we're having to look at things and figure out what it's going to look like in order to be safe there. And the reason we waited until the 24th was because we didn't want to limit the amount of people but we are gonna to have to think about some things as far as what Sunday school is gonna look like and different things opening up just from a standpoint of be better safe than sorry. And uh, with things like that in mind, what we wanna do at first, I know I had said to do a potluck the first Sunday we meet back, but uh, with some folks still being a little nervous about coming back and things like that, we wanna make sure that everybody's back into the swing of things. And then so we can really have a good one and really enjoy our time together. And so what we'll do is we will hold off on that first potluck back. And instead of doing it on that first Sunday, the 24th, we're going to wait until uh, we get everybody kind of back in the swing of things, back running together, and then just do a big one and really have a great Sunday after church together, spend some time together, bring some board games, and just really make an afternoon of it, spending time together once everybody's kind of comfortable uh, with doing that. So that's what we're going to plan on right now. As far as Sunday school and other things like that go, I'm going to be praying about that, talking with the, some of the folks about that, figuring out what we think is best as far as that happening, and then we will let you know through these videos and through email. And so in the meantime, uh, please continue to let us know if you or anyone around you has any needs, and we will do our best to help out where we can and, and just Keep working through this thing together. Uh, with that in mind, let's look tonight in James chapter 2 and pick up here where we left off last week around verse 14 and talk a little bit about what's being said here. And this is the faith and works section here in James chapter 2 starting at 14. And we're going to go to about uh, 26. And so just a little bit of passage here for us to look at tonight, kind of walk through it together and see what scripture says about this. Because faith and works, it's an interesting dichotomy, right? Because which one is more important? Now, obviously, faith is the ten amount, the, the first importance. You can't have the works of Jesus without the faith in him first. But are works important? And I think scripturally we see that, yes, they are. And we need to look at that tonight as we look at James chapter 2 and kind of talk about why it's important and why it matters. Obviously, we think about this. Are there stories of those who were saved without works? Obviously, the thief on the cross is one of those. He never got down. He never did anything with the salvation that he, he didn't witness to anybody. He didn't go on a mission trip. He didn't ever tithe. He was never, a, you know, he was never a Baptist, right? He didn't have a nine by 13 casserole dish and he didn't have a good banana pudding recipe. And so that we know of at least, but obviously he was saved because Jesus flat out told him today, you'll be with me in paradise. So when we look at this passage tonight, what we have to understand is, as we talk about faith and works, what this means is it's about those of us who, who receive Christ, who have faith and then continue on inside of our earthly life, that we keep going, right? Not those that, like the thief on the cross, who met Jesus, experienced Jesus, accepted Jesus, and then died. What we're talking about tonight are those of us that have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and have continued to live on after that, and why works are important for those of us inside of a relationship with Jesus like that. And so with that in mind, as we look at, starting at verse 14, it says this, what Good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? He's asking a question there. And I think generally James is asking that question because it's something he's curious about, right? Can someone be saved without works? Now, obviously, we think about the thief on the cross, and the answer is yes, clearly they can. But I believe, church, that if someone is truly a believer and has truly accepted Jesus Christ, that works are a natural byproduct of that relationship. So if someone is truly saved, there's going to be works there inside of that faith, inside of that salvation. Works come as a natural byproduct of our relationship with Jesus. As we strive to be more like him, works is a natural part of that transformation. And what do we mean by works? Well, what, do you mean, what we mean is just going above and beyond, doing things for people without being asked, helping out friends and neighbors, praying for somebody. Works it could be something just as simple as praying for someone, something as simple as sharing the gospel, just these small things that are works, things that we would not have done before Jesus 
that we do post acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The works, the things that Jesus gives us to do inside of that relationship. And so in 15, it says this, if a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? Right? That's the, that's the standard today is when somebody tells you what's going on in their life and we turn around and say, well, we'll pray for you. Right? Yeah, sometimes, yes, prayer is exactly what they need. But in this situation, when this person doesn't have clothes, doesn't have daily food, if we were to just turn around and say, well, we'll pray for that, and then that's the end of it, then we've missed the opportunity, right? If someone is lacking clothes and food and you have the ability to, to get them some food, get them some food, right? If you have some clothes you could loan, give some clothes, right? That's the thing, right? It's not, it's not enough to say that you'll pray for somebody who's hungry if you have the means to help them not be hungry, right? If you have the means and the ability to help someone not be hungry and you find someone who's in hunger, then help them. That's what we're told to do. That's what we're called to do in Scripture, right? That's, that's exactly what Jesus would have done. And so we see this in 16, it says, or in 17, it says, in the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. Faith without works is dead. I mean, James just flat out says it here, and I think we have to understand why he's saying that, because, like I said at the beginning of this, if we truly have relationship with Jesus Christ, then works are a natural byproduct of that relationship. And so if someone claims to be a Christ follower, yet they don't do the work that Jesus calls all believers to do, then that faith's probably not real, right? It's just words. It's just lip service to say, oh yeah, I'm saved, or oh yeah, I, I know Jesus, yeah, I've accepted Jesus. Really? Well, there should be some proof of that. Right? And, and so it says this in 18, it gets onto this a little bit. It says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you faith from my works. And that's what it gets at right there, church. The idea being that the faith we have in Jesus Christ can be shown and will be shown through the works we do in service to him. Right? How are we different now than we were before Jesus? part of our testimony, right? How are you different from when you met Jesus? What change has happened in your life because of your relationship with him? That's the works, folks. That's what, that's the change that comes over all of us, how we become different people inside of that relationship. You've got to have it. You've got to have those things. So then in 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. The idea here being that just an understanding that there is a God isn't necessarily enough, right? There's a lot of people that say, yeah, they believe that God is real, but they've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, the demons know exactly who God and Jesus are, and they know exactly what God and Jesus did, and still do, and they're still destined for hell. So just the simple thought of, oh yeah, I believe that God exists, therefore I am saved, that's not the case. Uh, we're told salvation comes from an acceptance of Jesus Christ, exactly what he did on the cross, right? Being born of a virgin, dying on the cross for our, our sins, living a perfect life, sinless life, and rising from the dead three days later. Uh, the belief in those and the acceptance of those and the admittance of sin and the need and admitting the need of Jesus for salvation is what gets us Right? Faith is that thing we talk about that is easy and difficult all at the same time. Right? When you're at church, we talk about faith in, in the simple aspect of the faith you have in the pews. Because you come and you sit and you've never tested for structural integrity. And so in some aspects, faith for us is easy. In other aspects, it's extremely difficult. We think about what's going on in our world right now. Faith in what we're hearing in the news and what we're hearing from doctors and nurses. Sometimes it's hard to trust. Because we're getting so many conflicting reports and things are changing so often. That's why we have to be careful what we allow ourselves to hear and do. And I'm challenging you, church, as I've challenged myself, be careful what you listen to right now. It, it Now is such a great time to sort of not listen to the news all the time, right? Give it a break. Go outside. Take a walk if you're able. Just If you can just go outside and breathe some fresh air. 
just allow yourself to decompress and not be caught up in this ever-changing news cycle. So as we continue in this, it says 20, Foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? And folks, we got to remember that because Abraham is pre-law, right? No Moses yet. The Ten Commandments hadn't come down. There's no law here, right? The, the law of the Old Testament wasn't around for Abraham. Yet what did he have? He had faith in that God called him to do something. God spoke to him and said, pack up your family, pack up your house, and go. And then eventually, I'll show you the land to stop at. And Abraham, in faith, did the work God called him to do. In the same way with his son, as we see right here, he's talking about with Isaac, right? Abraham had faith that God knew what he was doing when he told him to sacrifice the only son he knew, right? The thing that Abraham had been promised was land and heirs as numerous as the sand on the beach or the stars in the sky. Yet when he had the first heir, God told him to go sacrifice it. Abraham, in faith, did what God called him to do, was going to do the work, was, re was ready to do the work, when God relented and showed him that that wasn't necessarily what he had for him, but he was seeing if Abraham was going to do what he told him to do, if Abraham was going to do the work. And so we even go farther with that, and it says this, 22, you see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was perfected. So the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone, right? Faith alone for those of us that are still living inside of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Faith alone isn't enough. We've got to have the works. We've got to have the things God has called us to do and be doing those things in church. I know it's difficult right now, but maybe it's something as simple as praying for your neighbors, reaching out, making sure they've got enough to eat, making sure uh, that they're okay, just talking with somebody. A lot of folks just need to talk to somebody right now. They just need to hear a friendly voice. And some of you can be that friendly voice. You can be that voice that says, hey, this thing's going to be okay. I know this thing's going to be okay because I have a relationship with this guy named Jesus. And he tells me everything's going to be okay. Whatever that work is, church. So then we see in 25, it says, In the same way wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Church, we got to have the works. we got to have the things. we got to have the, the activeness. we got to have the, the works that we're supposed to be doing in order to further the kingdom of God. In church, we want to be about those things. And as fast as we can get back to doing those things, we want to do them at our church. Things like VBS, camps, all these different Bible studies and stuff that we're used to having, we want to get back to those things. But in the meantime, we're still keeping up with it through YouTube and, and all of those things. But church, I challenge you today to be about the work, to, to not only trust in the faith you have in Jesus Christ, but do the work he's called you to do. Church, let us pray. God, we thank you for today. Thank you for the ability to gather here and talk about the works you've called us to do. God, I pray that all of us would seek to do the work you've called us to do, that we would be the hands and feet to the community around us you've called us to be. God, we pray for our church as we prepare for this upcoming opening on the 24th, that we would just be wise in handling this the right way, that we would be smart, and that you would provide us the direction necessary in order to do it safely, in order to keep those doors open and not have to worry about shutting them again. God, we pray for our church family for all being affected by this virus, albeit from either having either having loved ones with the virus, God, or are being impacted from not being able to be around loved ones because of it. God, we just pray for protection. We pray for peace. God, for our doctors and nurses and our grocery store workers and truck drivers, we continue to pray protection over them. God, we continue to pray that this thing would burn out and it would go away and, and we could get back to the things you've called us to do outside of our homes and serving you and working uh, as you've called us to. God, we just thank you for the blessings you bestow upon us daily. And that's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, we're looking forward to the time that we can meet together again, and, and we're going to do it as carefully as we can to make sure we don't have to shut those doors again.
In the meantime, we love you. There's nothing you can do about that. Stay safe. We'll see you soon.